Thank you everyone for tuning into this session of sound bites looking at real world evaluation of over the counter hearing aids. Uh, we got um, a fair bit of work done in this space at the National Acoustic Laboratories, so my work uh, can only be seen complementary to the significant effort um, my colleagues and now I put into trying to understand um, who will benefit, who are the people and why they will benefit from these type, type of technologies and also uh, what are the barriers and limitations of the different types of uh, support people might get uh, in relation to um, improving the ability to hear in the world as they go about communicating in everyday business situations. Um, for my specific talk, uh, I will cover topics in relation to the O2C hearing aid devices, specifically uh, who needs O2C hearing aids. Um, we will look at one example of self-fitting technologies, some of the methods, efficacy and safety issues you might consider when you look at this type of technology, the benefits of O2C hearing aids and some of the barriers and difficulties uh, some of our participants in research have encountered while evaluating this type of technology. So we got a bit to cover, so let's jump into it and let's start with the introduction that Sean gave uh, quite eloquently about why, uh, what are over-the-counter dev uh, OTC devices. So the FDA definition uh, for OTC is that over-the-counter medical uh, over medical devices are those that may be offered for sale directly to the consumer. Uh, so in other words, you don't have to go to a clinician anymore. You might be able to log onto the internet on a website and request one of those devices for yourself, and you might be able to wear them. Um, one of the main criteria uh, uh, from the FDA point of view is that these devices need to provide some sort of safety to the user, need to be effective in improving the quality of hearing the person uh, is seeking to resolve, and they need to be affordable. And the affordability component means that they don't need to pay for a clinical uh, intervention, a secondary pathway for them to be able to receive these devices. So that is one of the reasons why we need to look at OTC devices. The other reason on why we need to see OTC devices is because we got many people around the world that require some sort of assistant in listening. And um, OTC devices offer an opportunity for them to have accessibility and affordability to these type of technologies to resolve the communication problems. Um, just take care of there. Moving to the next slide. So, uh, what are those markets? Well, more specifically, the reason why we have OTC the markets is because we are going to skip the uh, requirements for seeing a clinician to be able to fit these devices. So, we're looking at direct to consumer accessibility or pathways. These devices will be managed by the person who purchased them uh, in terms of how to fit them into the ears and how to manage the everyday usage technology with some support, of course, from the um, product, uh, uh, from the industry uh, that creates technology. Now, but who needs OTC hearing aids? Well, the obvious um, group of people that may require hearing aids are, of course, those people with some degree of hearing loss. So when you reach the 20 dB hearing loss criteria and you need to have some sort of amplification, uh, you may be qualified to a hearing aid in general, or you may be recommended to wear a hearing aid to resolve your audibility issues. But of course, the problem is bigger than that. Let me try to illustrate that by this figure here. So what we have here on the X axis is hearing loss. Uh, this is the conventional uh, audiogram average across four frequencies that would be the 500, 1K, 2K, and 4K. And on the Y axis, we have essentially a survey, uh, which is called the uh, Hearing Handicap Inventory. Um, and the Hearing Hand Handicap Inventory asks the questions of how frequently you encountered difficulties in everyday communication. So the higher the score, the more difficulty you have in communicating everyday listening. So uh, typically, uh, when we look at the at, um, dispensing of recommendations of hearing aids, we tend to look at the audiogram. 
because we have a diagnosis of hearing loss and we tend to guide our ability to fit hearing aids based on that diagnosis. We got the PTA or the audiogram uh, to program the hearing aid devices. So when we actually reach the, the number, the magical number of 20 dB hearing loss or above, we might consider that the person may be a good candidate uh, for hearing aid devices in general. Now, when you look at the Y score, on the other hand, you will see that people encounter difficulty in communications when even when they are have very near or very normal hearing. And so when we look at potential opportunities for this kind of technologies, uh, we're looking for a larger range of people that may be able to access technology to resolve the communication needs. Uh, this group of people, maybe then there may be a number of reasons why they are pro they need the kind of technology. One could be the financial component, but the accessibility to this kind of technology uh, makes a, a little bit more viable solution for them because without it, they may never reach or they never uh, consider to actually uh, wear hearing aids and resolve communication needs. Now, what's interesting about this group of people uh, and what's interesting about the Y axis is the Y axis queries the frequency of problems people might have, but the basis for, for them to generate this type of information is actually the hearing loss. So they actually um, and they uh, develop an, uh, a criteria for fitting devices when the score or recommending fitting devices when the score exceeds a, a certain number, in this particular case, eight. When people score above eight, uh, there's a potential recommendation for hearing aids. Uh, when people score below eight, um, there is not. However, we did an uh, interesting experiment now uh, trying to explore these a little bit longer, a uh, uh, little bit more. Uh, we do an online survey where we asked several people about the this particular uh, type of scoring and we related that to some other aspects of the daily life activities, particularly uh, the personality traits. And what we found using machine learning exploratory tools is that people with a uh, high level of neuroticism, which impacts you essentially your lifestyle, tend to score higher in the HHIES, uh, people with low levels of neuroticism, people that are not impacted by this tend to score lower. So there may be some factor influence that influence the everyday activity that may or might be not related to hearing, hearing uh, difficulties in noise. Um, what's also interesting is that if you have a low level of neuroticism, you tend to score more poorly when you look at speech intelligibility assessments than when you have high levels of neuroticisms. And of course, that gives an, a better indication that perhaps a lower score on the HHIES, uh, as soon as people uh, uh, ex, um, describe a problem in communication, perhaps those are the people really we need to focus on when we consider all OTC devices. So as soon as someone has described a problem here, perhaps there could be a potential candidate for this type of technology. And re got to remember, by the time people come to us and tell us there is a problem, probably they've been hiding the problem for a long time, trying to manage it themselves. So by the time they actually tell us there is a problem, uh, probably the product's more severe than what we actually think it, it, it is. Um, so um, let's now explore a second component in relation to this type of technology, and this is the idea of self-fitting. Um, and when it comes to self-fitting, uh, we always think about the friction gains, and we don't know we need to match those gains. And you look at the um, guidelines we tend to follow. Um, we believe that, or we all often think about um, uh, the targets we need to reach should be within the 5 dB reference between the 250 and 2000 kilohertz in relation to the prescribed amplification and the prescriptions like now NO2 may tell us to achieve. And in the higher frequencies, it's likely higher to about plus or minus 8 dB. Um, so if a person is self-fitting their devices, do they achieve this, this kind of very tight criteria because at the end of the day, they need to do it themselves? And as we know, 
placement in the ear canal may influence the ability to how accurate this, this uh, amplification profiles would be established. And you are an audiologist, you know that even position the probe in the ear canal is an impact on this uh, match to target type of uh, assessment using real, uh, real ear measurements. To actually evaluate that, we conducted a clinical study uh, in collaboration with a, a company partner, sponsor partner, New Hira. Um, and we also extended that study uh, as a post uh, usability study test at the end to determine some of the barriers people might have with this type of technology. So in this clinical study, we actually involved technology called New Hira Acubats. Uh, these are the pro, pro devices, and these are here next that are pending clearance, still pending clearance from the FDA uh, at this point in time. Nonetheless, we evaluated them with a group of participants from our lab uh, to 41 participants, and they have near normal and mild hearing losses. But one of the things they have in common is that they all consistently reported hearing noise difficulties. Uh, and of course, the devices uh, in the study were self-fitted uh, using the proprietary software that Nihira calls the Nihira ER ID. So these are some of the results we observed in our study. Uh, so on the left side, you see the actual peer-tone audiograms that they were acquired by the clinicians. So these were done by a clinical support. So we used red measures to determine these audiograms. And then uh, on the middle line here, uh, what we actually see is the insertion gain measures in relation to the targets. So how did we look at the deviations from target essentially? So um, the red lines um, in these figures indicate the plus or minus uh, uh, dV, 5 dV from target, and the different figures indicate the level. So we start from the very low levels of 55, 65, and 80 dV SPL. And what we can see that the most important thing to note in these figures is that the level, the deviation from target is created by the white, indicated by the white axis for the uh, low, uh, middle and high levels are within the 5 dB range, except when we hit uh, some high frequencies. Now, we actually tested how uh, important that was using statistical measurements, and he, these are tabulated here, uh, where it's actually showed that around 4K, we have a significant deviation for target uh, across the participants. And so of course, these measurements show the average scores across, across participants, and when you look at individual measurement, there is a slightly larger deviation, of course. Uh, but from a group population point of view, uh, we don't see that the average uh, for the mid range for parallel low frequencies has a significant deviation from the prescribed criteria of amplification uh, only in the high frequencies. OK, so. Um, what we did then, once we um, people self-fitted these devices, the next step in this clinical study is to allow them to go out in the real world and to tell us how they experience the real world uh, environments using something we call the EMA or Ecologically Momentary Assessment Technology, which is essentially an app that tells you that people uh, that service the person about the listening experience when they are having the communications, having the difficulty in communications. Uh, so the app will actually start when the piece of having a conversation, when the person has a conversation or the participant has a conversation in the real world and the participant needs to enter the experience in the app. The app records the experience and at the same time it records the environment they are in, in terms of the acoustic features the environment has and the type of environment people find themselves. And then we bring this to the lab and we do some in, in very deep analysis of that data that to understand what the person experiences in the real world and the reason why. Um, so uh, in, when it comes to um, the laboratory assessments we, we do before people actually go into the real world, uh, we ask people to evaluate this type of technology in relation to listening to a sound in front of them using a loudspeaker array. So we position noises around them, which simulated uh, some sort of rest restaurant. We use ambisonics type of reproduction, and we presented a target speech in front of them. Uh, uh, so one of the things we found is that the device, when had the directional microphone activated, 
provided the greatest benefit across multiple dimensions of listeners. So those dimensions of listeners we assess are describing this a spider plot in relation to species naturalness, uh, uh, being able to follow the toy car, the, uh, in the eliminating the annoyance of the background noise and the lines of the background noise, uh, as well as the sand plot. And you can see that the more out of the figure, the plot, the, 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 the lines on these aspire plots are the better for the participants. And when people activate the directional microphone, they tend to have better uh, perception of the naturalness, uh, ease of difficulty, uh, and satisfaction uh, when listening to the background noises as well. So in general, uh, the devices in the lab provided a much better experience, although we did not see a significant differences between the unaided and the aided condition, although there was a slight improvement for the aided conditions in terms of perception. Now let's move into the real world benefit and to assess the real world benefit, um, we asked the uh, questions about the frequency of travel people might have while communicating with others. Uh, which is uh, is captured by a questionnaire called the AFAP, and it captures this across multiple dimensions. Uh, one of the dimensions relates to the ease of communications, the difficulty in word vibration, uh, background noise, and assertiveness, and that is the detection of annoying and placing high high noises like uh, squealy sounds uh, people often uh, perceive with hearing aid amplification. So across the main criteria of communication, which are the um, easy communication, background noise and reverberation, and we notice a significant difference between the, the unaided condition and the condition where the participant was aided, uh, when we actually saw a significant drop in the frequency and the frequency when people reported problems in those conditions. So in other words, the aided condition assisted the participants in communicating more effectively in these real-world listening conditions. Uh, the EMA also captured a uh, real-world experience, so we actually saw that in proportion wise, uh, the people reported more benefit when they were the devices, which is shown by this dark gray area on the plot, than when they're not wearing the devices, or uh, when the devices made no difference in the in communications in the everyday listening situations. So uh, most of the benefits were reported when people were aided, uh, and there were some instances when people, a uh, significant number of instances when people reported benefits also from directional amplifications. Uh, what's interesting about this is that people also reported no benefit when we were expecting some benefit, people when directional microphones were on, and the reason we expect benefits is because we saw that in the laboratory, of course. Every time you switch on directional microphone, you expect to see some sort of improvement by listeners. One of the reasons we were uh, observed that people were not perceiving a benefit uh, with directional amplification was because simply the environments were not noisy enough for the directional amplification to provide any advantage in listening. And this is displayed by this figure. When we actually show on the x-axis, we show the level recorded by the app in terms of the environment level. And on the y-axis, we show the number of times people reported a significant improvement uh, from the devices. And we can see that the improvement was leaning towards when the level was highest and less so when the level was lowest. Which uh, is uh, uh, in relation to the uh, what people might hear around them in terms of level. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to show you that um, we also related the match to target, the to target to the actual scores people were reporting. Uh, through the EMA and also through other means. Uh, and, and that would give us an indication whether people, the, the, the difference in match to target was um, predictive of the benefit. And we found that the, whether or not people have a very good feeling or not, uh, did not predict the outcomes for our study. Uh, so the fact that people have some, a few deviations from the target gains, that the formula prescribed, in this case, the NAL ML2, uh, did not predict it whether people benefited receive any benefit from these hearing aid devices. Um, the devices were user friendly and this is clearly described by this figure when we actually look at how easy was the ear ID, how how easy it was to fit it into the ear and how easy it was to use it. We use the app the device came into and, and the easiness is described by the yellow and these purple lines uh, colors and you can see that they cover most of the charts across all the different dimensions. So in general, the devices were mostly uh, very easy to fit, 
uh, and very easy in the, the, the app that came with it was was very easy to manage. One of the interesting people um, described in terms of wearing devices, whether they like it or not. So this is the cloud uh, figures, cloud words on how frequently we observe words like usability, the noise and amplification when people like the devices. In relation to, to when people did not like the devices, we often saw things like occlusion, bulkiness, and a little bit of adaptation to the technology. Uh, so there are many pros on wearing the devices according to our participants, and there were some cons. So just to summarize this, um, the take home message behind this is that here in AIS, May, this type of hearing may offer uh, directly to the consumer with a clinical intervention, um, who needs the devices, people with normal to mild hearing losses, and who report having difficulties uh, hearing in every listening situations. Uh, the soft technology, uh, the apps were very easy to use. We saw no evidence of adverse events in our studies. Uh, and even when we observed some deviation to targets, the, this did not have an impact on the overall benefit we observed either in the lab or in the real world. Um, we observe significant benefits of the devices in some listening situations, in many listening situations, particularly when we have noise around the listener. So there is an indication that people might benefit from some casual use, usage of these devices. And we saw some barriers in, in relation to the connectivity to phones. Uh, this is quite typical when you actually have devices that are, need to uh, communicate with mobile technology. And also on the size of the devices, there were some reporting issues by very, very few listeners in relation to, to being able to fit the devices into the ears. Okay, um, I hope this can give you some glance as to what the OTC devices offers to the world. And I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and now, uh, and also the sponsor for the clinical uh, study we did, uh, New Hera team from Australia and the USA. Mm -hmm.